There are as many reasons why aerospace projects fail as there are failed projects. There are projects which were too aggressive for the technology of their time, projects which relied on unproven science, ones which were obsolete on arrival because they did too little, or those that tried to do too much. Those sunk by budgetary losses or by a change of government, or hampered by a government too enthusiastic about the design. The list goes on. To misquote Tolstoy, successful planes are all alike. Every unsuccessful plane is unsuccessful in its own way. Last video, we saw how the P6M Seamaster was obsoleted immediately prior to introduction by the development of the submarine-launched ballistic missile. Today, we're looking at an aircraft designed to perform as a low-level, high-speed strike bomber for the Air Force, and as a long-range carrier defense fighter for the Navy, a joint strike fighter, if you will. But this isn't the 2000s, and we're not talking about the F-35. The year is 1961, Vietnam is heating up, and the General Dynamics F-111 Aardvark is today's flight of fancy. With all of the press surrounding the F-35, it is easy to forget that the idea of using the same aircraft across multiple branches of the U.S. military isn't a new concept. Since the dawn of the jet age, the cost and complexity of military aircraft has grown exponentially. As a result, militaries have been forced to dramatically lower the number of types of aircraft that they field. In the U.S. military in particular, this has led to increased congressional pressure on the Department of Defense to develop aircraft to serve in multiple branches of the military. The first example of this was the concerted effort to adapt the North American F-86 Sabre into Navy service. The modified version was named the FJ-2 Fury, sharing a name with a similar, earlier North American carrier jet. The FJ-2 and its later variants were deployed with the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Marine Corps between 1954 and 1962, where it performed satisfactorily before being phased out in favor of the F-8 Crusader, F-11 Tiger, and A-4 Skyhawk. This continued a trend established in World War II, where the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps would deploy the same or very similar aircraft. This was mainly due to the fact that the Marine units are often embarked on Navy carriers. And the Army Air Force, which gained in independence of the Army to become the Air Force, flew more unique types. The main reason for this is extremely simple. Dedicated aircraft are more effective and individually cheaper to develop and operate than a multi-role aircraft. It is only when development and cross-service maintenance and training costs are considered that multi-service aircraft are beneficial. The Marine Corps and Navy share a closely related training pipeline and often operate together, so there are greater benefits of sharing types. However, as costs grew, there was increased governmental pressure to collaborate with the Air Force as well. Since the Fury, there has only been one other example of cross-branch unity in the U.S. military, the legendary F-4 Phantom. The F-4 was originally conceived as an upgraded version of McDonald's F-3H Demon to serve the Navy as an attack fighter. The F-A-18 Hornet fills a very similar role today. The concept was later expanded into a fleet defense interceptor, which necessitated the addition of a radar intercept officer to operate the powerful radar set. The F-4 was accepted for service with the Navy and Marine Corps in 1959 and entered service at the end of 1960. In January of 1961, at the behest of the Department of Defense and its powerful new secretary, Robert McNamara, the Air Force borrowed two F-4Bs from the Navy and flew them in competitions against their highest performing interceptor, the F-106 Delta Dart. Less than a month later, after the results of the competition were in, the Air Force submitted their own set of requirements to McDonnell for an Air Force version of the F-4, and the DoD had their first true joint strike fighter. As time would prove, the F-4 was a plane that could do everything. It was a heavy fighter, a fast interceptor, a strike bomber, and a reconnaissance platform that could operate from land or sea. The only thing it couldn't do was dogfight, but the full nature of that particular limitation wasn't fully realized in 1961, as the F-4 could simply eliminate targets at long range with its radar and missiles, after all. Emboldened by their success with the F-4, McNamara and the DoD convinced the Air Force and the Navy to combine their two next-generation aircraft requirements into a single design competition, the Tactical Fighter Experimental Competition, TFX. To get an idea of what roles the aircraft was going to be expected to fill, it is beneficial to look at both the aircraft that the TFX was designed to supplant and the designs which were on the drawing board before the merger. From the Navy side of things, the design began with the F-6D Missileer concept, a subsonic, straight-winged aircraft appearing like an enlarged F-3D Sky Knight. It would carry a powerful radar set and long-ranged air-to-air missiles. It could loiter over the fleet and independently detect and eliminate threats. As this aircraft would have been incapable of defending itself or evading opposing fighters, the concept was eventually merged with a combat role, where it would take on the duties of the F-4 Phantom or F-8 Crusader in regards to being able to engage enemy fighters somewhat favorably, 
especially with the advantage of a powerful electronic sweep. On the other side, the Air Force was also looking to replace their F-4s, but for a different reason. They liked the speed and ground attack capabilities of the Phantom, but wanted a dedicated strike aircraft capable of delivering precision payloads at high speed and weren't worried about the aircraft's effectiveness as a fighter. Additionally, the new aircraft would take over the Wild Weasel role, engaging and destroying enemy surface-to-air weapons. Combined flights of F-4s and the new strike fighter working in tandem could eliminate threats both in the air and ground more effectively than a single at type could. It's easy to say that these missions were diametrically opposed, and the create an aircraft following these restrictions is obviously impossible, but that's boring and misses many of the lessons that can be learned from this story. It is important to remember that the design requirements were released within months of the Phantom being accepted as a tri-service fighter, and the design process was taking place as the Phantom proved itself in nearly every niche that it found itself in. To that end, it seems extremely likely that the successes of the Phantom ultimately doomed its would-be successor to failure and scandal. Every aircraft design is a series of compromises. There's no such thing as a free lunch, they say. Every design decision has positive and negative aspects, and the art of aerospace engineering is to decide on the optimum balance of these compromises. Given the sheer number of roles the TFX was going to have to fill, there were going to be a lot of compromises. A very useful concept in engineering is the idea of a trade space. There are a series of facts, and the job of the engineer is to find the optimum combination. For the purposes of this video, I will be discussing the maneuverability, speed, payload trade space. To illustrate this, let's start with filling in the space with famous aircraft. The F-4, which we've been talking so much about, had a very good combination of speed and payload at the expense of maneuverability. A contemporary to it was the A-4 Skyhawk, which had excellent payload capability for its size and maneuverability, but lost its speed. Finally, light fighters such as the F-5 Freedom Fighter had excellent maneuverability and speed, but limited payload. The limits here aren't absolute, as technological developments allow for increases across all areas. Additionally, the physical size of an aircraft can be traded as well, since larger aircraft can carry more payload without sacrificing either speed or maneuverability. This is a major reason for the size creep of aircraft today, and part of the reason modern fighters can now carry heavier bomb loads than early jet bombers. However, increasing size has its own cost, particularly in terms of expense, weight, and maintenance cost. Additionally, when designing for the Navy, size is critical, as the aircraft have to be able to operate from existing aircraft carriers. With all that in mind, let's take a look at how the concepts received for the TFX competition took on the challenge of optimizing within a massive design space. In increasing order of weirdness, we have General Dynamics, with a disappointingly normal-looking submission, North American Aviation, who clearly cheated off their XB-70 and A-5 programs, Grumman, whose submission was turned upside down halfway through the development and never fixed. Boeing, with a refreshingly creative overwing intake design. Then McDonnell and Lockheed copying each other's notes on their ideas for a long swing wing with pod-mounted tail engines. And finally, we have Vought and Republic's glorious fever dream of an airplane. This is something I can get behind. The first thing you will notice looking through these designs is that all of them have variable geometry wings. This makes a lot of sense, as they morph between a high-speed delta wing and a low-speed straight wing, but there are no free lunches, and variable geometry wings add complexity, manufacturing cost, and most critically, weight. The best way to counteract the added weight of the swing wing without sacrificing payload mass is to increase the size of the aircraft, and this too is reflected in the designs. They are all much larger than many contemporary aircraft at the time. Boeing's proposal had a gross weight of 35 tons, 10 tons heavier than the already large F-4 Phantom, or even the A-5 carrier-based strike bomber, which was already in service at the time. However, this wasn't necessarily a deal-breaker, as the Douglas A-3 Sky Warrior was of similar size and weight. The most serious competitors for the design competition appear to have been Republic, Lockheed, Boeing, and General Dynamics, as they were the only ones which assembled full-scale mock-ups. Of these, it appears that the Navy took one look at the Republican proposal and realized they never did anywhere near an aircraft carrier, and the Lockheed one looks like it went too far towards the strike bomber role as opposed to the interceptor fighter role and was discarded for similar reasons. The Boeing design was near universally considered the most capable across the board, but the major thorn in its side was that there was less than 50% commonality between the Navy and Air Force versions. Significant changes, including better engines, would also be needed to make the design acceptable, but a selection board ruled that this was the best option to choose, despite the Navy finding none of the designs acceptable. Seeing as the purpose of the program was to create a single aircraft with served both roles, 
it seems fairly reasonable that this is what sunk Boeing's proposal in the eyes of McNamara and the DOD. Thus, the Department of Defense selected the General Dynamics design, as it was a single airframe design that, at least on paper, fulfilled both requirements roughly to the same degree, coming the closest to a true compromise design. The contract was awarded to General Dynamics in December of 1962, despite Boeing's protest. They lacked experience with naval fighters, so they teamed up with Grumming to produce the F-111B, which was the naval variant. However, as the detailed design evolved, it became increasingly clear that the dream of the Joint Strike Fighter wasn't going to be realized. Design changes were made lengthening the airframe to accommodate an internal weapons bay and more fuel, as well as introducing the F-111 namesake Aardvark nose, holding the advanced terrain-following radar used for low-level flight. These changes brought a toll on the weight of the aircraft. The Navy's target weight of 27 tons gross weight slipped farther and farther as it grew from 30 tons to nearing 40 tons, gross weight by the time the first aircraft rolled off the pre-production line. The first Air Force F-111A flew in December of 1964, and the navalized F-111B followed five months later in May of 1965. It took Grumman and General Dynamics nearly a year to work out the problems with the test aircraft, with acceptance trials beginning mid-1966. At this point, it became extremely clear that the direction the aircraft had evolved was not favorable to the Navy's version. This was a direct product of McNamara's push for commonality between the designs at all costs, as well as an apparent favoritism towards the Air Force and the designs. The aircraft the Air Force got was exactly what the requirements wanted. A superb low-level attacker, capable of flying at extremely low altitudes and delivering a precision bomb load four times heavier than the F-4 could carry. However, for the naval role, it was extremely overweight due to all of the structural reinforcements, internal weapons bay, and the complex pylons on the rotating portion of the wing. To make matters worse, the cockpit position was extremely unfavorable to carrier operations, with glare from the windscreen often obscuring the view of the flight deck, and the side-by-side -side seating left the pilot buried deep in the cockpit with poor visibility during combat maneuvers. As Grumman and General Dynamics tried to massage out the issues with the F-111B, the Navy and the general public were becoming more and more opposed to the program. The high-profile nature of the program pushed it into the public eye far more so than a pair of separate de development programs would have been. Aided by the rise in anti-war sentiment, opposition to the military-industrial complex was increasingly present in American culture through the mid to late 1960s. TFX became a household phrase, and the F-111 entered pop culture in a way unlike any aircraft before it, as exemplified by James Rosenquist's pop art masterpiece, which covers four walls with a depiction of the aircraft, juxtaposed with images of nuclear explosions, everyday objects of American home life, and floral print patterns. As it turns out, neither the Air Force nor the Navy were in favor of the TFX either. Remember that they were strong-armed by McNamara and Kennedy into accepting the compromise solution in the first place, and the Navy wanted a way out. Their opportunity came in March of 1968, when a Senate hearing convened to hear the merits of additional spending packages for the F-111B program. Surprised when Rear Admiral Tom Connolly was opposed to the spending, Senator John C. Stennis asked him if new engines would make the design acceptable to the Navy, to which Connolly famously replied, there isn't enough thrust in all of Christendom to make a Navy fighter out of that airplane. With, with that, congressional opinion shifted against the F-111B to the point that McNamara was overruled. The naval variant was canceled in May of 1968. Wasting no time, NAVAIR released a set of requirements for a new fleet air defense interceptor that July. Seeing the opportunity to make good on last time, many of the old TFX proposals were dusted off and new designs for a purely naval fighter were brought forwards, resulting in a very wide field of proposals. Owing to their experience gained from the F-111B program, the Navy selected Grumman as the contract winner over the other finalist, McDonnell Douglas, in January of 1969. As you may have guessed, this resulted in the legendary F-14 Tomcat. However, more interestingly, the McDonnell Douglas design laid important groundwork which would lead to the F-15 Eagle. With all of the trials of the development process behind it, and freed from the Navy's requirements of the fighter, the F-111A and its later variants ultimately went on to be extremely effective low-level attack bombers. Pilots would use the train-following radar to fly as low as 200 feet above terrain at near supersonic speeds, rendering them near unkillable to ground fire or surface-to-air missiles. The Aardvark would go on to have the lowest loss rate for combat aircraft over Vietnam, with only six combat losses in over 4,000 missions flown. Additionally, thanks to the radar, they could operate in all weather conditions, making them difficult to find and kill from the air too. The F-111 and its successors would serve in the U.S. Air Force between 1967 and 1996, and the electronic warfare variant, the EF-111 Raven, would continue to serve until 1998.
It saw foreign service with the Royal Australian Air Force between 1968 and 2010, where they used it as an effective strike deterrent throughout the area thanks to its long unrefueled range, a fortunate holdover from the Navy's requirements. It saw good service there, but was eventually retired in favor of the F-35 with the F-A-18 as an interim solution. Because of this long period of service, it would be hard to call the F-111 program a complete failure. However, the TFX program was definitely failed to meet its objective of designing a multi-service aircraft. Therefore, it would be prudent to look at the reasons that the F-111B failed to meet its designed role in the same way that the Air Force variant did. The takeaway from the F-111 is to think critically about not whether you are solving the problem correctly, but whether you are solving the right problem. It is clear that the engineers from General Dynamics delivered the best aircraft that they could given the problem at hand. However, the problem should have been challenged more harshly at the beginning. Had the Air Force and Navy pushed harder on the sheer challenge posed by the requirements, either McNamara would have given way, or they could have agreed to a descoped version with more limited capabilities, but able to achieve them to a much greater degree. As a caveat, this is not to say that multi-role aircraft cannot work in any form. As we saw, the TFX derivatives, both the F-15 Eagle and the F-14 Tomcat, are superb multi-role aircraft, serving as air superiority fighters, strike aircraft, and as true interceptors. Rather, the intent is to ensure that the design choices are made not to favor one feature, as the F-111 did the ground strike role, to the extreme deficit of other roles. Additionally, when trying to form a compromise solution, you should always note how much ground exists between the two poles. As a way of visualizing this, let's return to the trade space diagrams. The F-4's roles are clustered near the go-fast carry payload side, which worked perfectly both for fighter bombers and interceptors. On the other hand, the F-111's roles were spread much farther apart, meaning that the roles would be fighting against each other more. As a final cap on the TFX story, the exact wrong takeaway here is to think that compromise is bad. Quite the contrary. Engineering is the art of making compromises, and choosing the best combination of options to fill a role or solve a problem is what makes it so interesting. Obviously, this is much easier said than done, and it's the reason why I'm talking about how it went wrong on the internet and not doing this in real life quite yet. This balance of compromises comes up quite often when I'm building in KSP, where the trade phase I operate in is between looks, performance, and part count. Every craft that I build falls somewhere on this spectrum, and it is an important thing that I consider when I'm planning a replica build, since it helps me set a goal for how the final craft should turn out. I often find myself balancing harder in favor of looks and performance, simply because I enjoy pushing boundaries within the stock game. Even mechanisms such as swing wings are just another fun challenge. Building the wings of the F-111 required a new way of doing pure stock mechanics, so I and a few other builders discovered and developed what we call bendy tech. It takes advantage of the inherent flexibility of joints to create flexible structures, which can be moved to form all moving tail surfaces, the internal missile bay, and naturally the aardvark's distinctive wings. But with all things, it's not a perfect technique, and it has its limitations. The landing gear had to be made using traditional stock mechanics, for example. The landing gear for this build were built by HB Stratos, with whom I collaborated to build this plane. It was a months long process of perfecting each of the individual mechanical elements of this craft, but we're quite proud of the final project. HB's got a channel of his own with some lovely craft showcase cinematics, so do check him out. There is a craft download in the description, along with a link to each of our Kerbal X pages where you will find download links to each of the other planes featured in this video as well. That brings us to a close of the second Flights of Fancy. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm continuing to experiment with the format of these videos. Please let me know what you liked or didn't like about this one. No promises, but I think the next episode will talk about the most ungainly carrier fighter ever flown, the Vought F7U Cutlass, in a return to build time lapses. But for now, happy flying, and I'll see you in the next one.